Good morning, brethren. Please take your Bibles and turn to Ruth chapter 2. Turn to the book of Ruth and chapter 2. So we have started this new book of Ruth and it's only four chapters long. Uh, so uh, look at verse number 8 for me. Ruth chapter 2 and verse number 8. The Bible reads, Then saith Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou not, my daughter? Go not to glean in another field. That's the title for the sermon this morning. Go not to glean in another field. Okay, go not to glean in another field. So just a, a reminder of what took place in the first chapter. We had Ruth and Naomi. Uh, Ruth was the mother-in-law and Naomi, sorry, Naomi was the mother-in-law and Ruth was the daughter-in-law and they had their husbands, they perished, they, they passed away and they, were, they found themselves in Moab. Of course, Ruth was a Moabitess who married one of uh, Naomi's sons. And then the decision after 10 years of living in the land of Moab was to go back to uh, Judah, go back to Bethlehem, the city that uh, they were originally from. And so we pick up the story here. We're, we're dealing with a mother-in-law and a daughter-in-law that are very poor, that, that are widows, that don't have anything to come back to. In fact, uh, um, Naomi said that when she, they had left, that they went with they went full, and when they were coming back, they were returning back empty. So these are very poor women coming back to, to Bethlehem. And so we pick up the story here in verse number one, Ruth chapter two and verse number one. It says, And Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a, a mighty man of wealth, of the family of Emimelech, and his name was Boaz. So we see a kinsman. A kinsman, if you don't know, is a blood relative, you know, a, a blood relative. So Boaz is a blood relative to, to uh, Amimelech, who was Naomi's husband. Look at verse number two. And Ruth the Moabite said unto Naomi, Let me now go to a field and glean ears of corn after him, in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. And so Ruth, being the younger, obviously Naomi being a more elderly woman, uh, Ruth decides to go and, and glean ears of corn. Now when the Bible says uh, corn, obviously it's a different uh, way of, of the way we think of corn. We think of corn as that, as that uh, what, what do we call it, that, that yellowish you know, uh, vegetable, or is it a fruit you know, <laughs> that, that we eat. But corn, especially in the times of the, uh, you know, when the King James Bible was translated, meant any kind of wheat. And you'll see as we read through this chapter that the type of wheat that was being harvested was barley. Okay, it was barley. And so uh, Naomi decides, or, or Ruth decides to go and, and do some gleaning. Now, if you don't know what that is, please keep your finger there and turn to the book of Deuteronomy. Turn to the book of Deuteronomy, please, chapter 24. Deuteronomy chapter 24. And while you're turning to Deuteronomy 24, I'm going to read to you from Leviticus chapter 19 to show you the law of gleaning, what this is all about. Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 9 reads, And when ye reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not wholly reap the corners of thy field, neither shalt thou gather the gleanings of thy harvest. And so when you've planted, if you've owned land and you've planted and your harvest has grown, you then go and collect, you go and harvest what you've grown, don't you? But the commandment was, you know, leave the corners, you know, just harvest the, the main, you know, get, get the most of what you can from, from what's uh, centralized, but don't go around all the corners. You know, you don't have to pick up everything that you've grown is what, what God commands the Israelites, okay? You know, leave a little bit behind. And then in verse number nine, it says, and thou shalt not glean thy vineyard, neither shalt thou gather every grape of thy vineyard. Thou shalt leave them for the poor and stranger, I am the Lord, your God. And so the reason why God wanted harvesters to leave a little bit, you know, don't pick up every little thing that you've, you've, uh, you've planted, was for the poor and the needy. This was the way that God in the Old Testament times would take care of people that were poor, people like widows, people that needed, people that didn't have anything to their disposal. They would go after uh, the land has been harvested and they would go and collect for themselves to, to eat for themselves. Okay, that was God's plan. And if you think that's, well, that's stealing, you know, that's taking someone else's property. Well, of course, it's not stealing if God's commanding them to do that. But then if you read the next verse in number, verse number 11, it says, Ye shall not steal, neither deal falsely, neither lie one to another. 
So of course, you know, just the next verse says, hey, don't steal, you know, don't lie, don't cheat. And so of course, you know, if God has just finished commanding them, you know, people that harvest to leave a little bit of the gleanings behind for the poor, that is not stealing, okay? Now you are in Deuteronomy chapter 24, look at verse number 19, chapter 24 and verse number 19, we have the same command being uh, given here, but it gives us a little bit more information. It says, when thou cuttest down thine harvest in thy field, and has forgot a sheaf in the field, thou shalt not go again to fetch it. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow, that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all the work of thine hands. So even if you're harvesting, you're collecting, let's say you're putting you know, your, your, your wheat into bags, and you go and, and you collect all the bags, and then you think, oh, I, I, I forgot a bag. You know, I, I forgot something that we've collected. You know, God says, well, don't go back. Just leave it there. Leave it there for the poor. Leave it for the stranger. Look at the fatherless and for the widow. And of course, Naomi and Ruth were widows. Okay. And so, you know, and then look, and you say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm missing out. If I don't go and collect what I forgot in the field, you know, I'm going to, to miss out. I won't be able to get the profit that I need. But God says that if you do that, that he will bless thee in all the work of thine hands. You see, God, you know, he's is, is an amazing God. You know, the way we ought to live our lives is not just how much can we gain, but we ought to live our lives in light of the commandments, in light of the scriptures that God gives us. And if, if God sees us trying to live for him, God will bless the work of our hands. God will give us more than you trying to, you know, profit as much as you possibly can. No, God will give you more when you look out for the needs of others, when you follow the commandments that God has given us. Look at verse number 20. In Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 20. When thou beatest thine olive tree, thou shalt not go over the bows again. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow. When thou gatherest the grapes of thy vineyard, thou shalt not glean it afterward, it shall be for the stranger, and for the fatherless, and for the widow. And thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in the land of Egypt, therefore I command thee to do this thing. So why? Why were they commanded to leave a little bit for the fatherless, for the widows, for the strangers, for the poor? To remind them that they were once bondmen, that they were once enslaved by the Egyptians. There was a time when the Israelites had nothing. When they were poor, when they were oppressed, when they had a great need, and God was able to deliver them out of Egypt. And God's saying, look, you were once in a bad place. Well, I want you to think about others that are in a bad place. I want you to think about those that are poor and needy and make sure that you can give to them, be, you know, provide for other people the way that God provided for them when he delivered them out of the hand of the Egyptians. Now, this becomes important as we go into the rest of this chapter. Let's go back to Ruth chapter 2 and verse number 3. Ruth chapter 2 and verse number 3. And she went, that is Ruth, and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers that her hap was to light on a part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was a kindred of Elimelech. And so when it says here that obviously she went to reap, and the field that she went to, it says here, and her hap was to light on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz. When the Bible says here, hap, H-A-P, it's where we get the word happenstance from. You know, when something is, you know, you talk about something that is happenstance, we're saying that is by chance. You know, so the Bible's saying here, it's just by chance the field that Ruth went to was the field that belonged to Boaz. Okay? Verse number four. And behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said unto the reapers, the Lord be with you. And they answered him, the Lord bless thee. We immediately see Boaz. We see that this is a man of God. The fact that, you know, the first words that comes out of his mouth when he sees his workers working on his, on his field, you know, he speaks of the Lord. The Lord be with you. You know, the Lord bless the work of your hands. And they, they repeat back, yeah, the Lord bless thee also, you know. Verse number five. Then said Boaz unto his servants that was set over the reapers, whose, whose damsel is this? So Boaz sees Ruth gleaning on his land. He says, who is this lady? Verse number five, uh, verse number six. And the servant that was set over the reapers answered and said, it is the Moabit Moabitish damsel that came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. 
And she said, I pray you, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and have continued even from the morning until now that she tarried a little in the house. So Boaz asks, who is she? They say, well, she's, a, she's from Moab. She's a daughter-in-law of, of Naomi. And she's been working all day, you know, from morning until now. The only time she rested was when she tarried a little bit in the house. And so she's working all day. And when it says here that she tarried a little bit in the house, it's the fact that she was taking like a bit of a break. So obviously, even those that were gleaning, you know, especially if you're gleaning all day as, as a poor and stranger, you will need time during the day to take a break, you know, to take a rest and then continue working afterwards. And what the thought that I get to when I read this passage was your lunch break. You know, for those of you that are employed, that you, you know, you work, you know, 8, 10, 12 hours a day, normally your employer will give you a lunch break. And if you've ever wondered, hey, is this biblical? You know, is it biblical to take a rest during the day? Amen. Right? We see here that even the, the poor and the needy, the widows, those that are gleaning on the field, took rest in the house that was on that land. You know? And um, so what I gather out of this, brethren, is that it is important to take a break. It is important to take rest from time to time. If you can keep your finger there and go to Mark chapter 6 for me. Go to Mark chapter 6. And while you're turning there, I'm going to read to you from Genesis chapter 2 and verse number 2. And of course, we're going back to the creation when God created the world. He created the universe, created all things in six days. And then we know on the seventh day, he rested, right? Genesis chapter 2 verse 2. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. So God sets the example. Once he created all things in six days, he takes a time, a day to rest. And this is a great principle, you know, for, for anyone that is a workaholic especially, you need a time to rest. You know, in, in my own life, there's been times where I've been an employee I've had a lot of work to, to do and lunchtime has rolled around and instead of taking the break, I've worked through lunch. I'm sure many of you can relate to that where, you know, instead of taking a rest, you've just, well, there's so much to do, you've gone ahead and just, I'm going to take the advantage of this extra hour or half an hour, whatever you're given to, to work. But then what you find when you don't take your rest, as, you get late, as it gets later in the day, you become lethargic, you become tired. You know, mentally, you're, you're unable to accomplish as much as you would have if you had just taken that rest in the first place. And this is so important that we allow our bodies. You know, again, does God really need to rest? He rested, though. He rested on day number seven. And so he set a great example about the need to rest. And uh, look at Mark chapter 6. You're at Mark chapter 6 and verse number 30. Mark chapter 6 and verse number 30. And we continue, obviously, when you hear in verse number 30, Jesus Christ had just finished doing a lot of work, a lot of preaching. And then in verse number 30, it says, And the apostles gathered, uh, gathered themselves together unto Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. So it's not just Jesus doing teaching and, and preaching, but even his disciples, even his apostles had come back and reported to Jesus of all the work that they had done, all the preaching that they had taught. And in verse number 31, And he said unto them, that's Jesus, said unto them, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest for a while. For there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. And they departed into a desert place by ship privately. And so Jesus, you know, he, he's an employer of the apostles. You know, he's the one that instructed them to do the work. He's the one that instructed them to, to serve the people. And he sees and he hears back their report of, of work. Jesus Christ himself has been working in the ministry. And he says, all right, listen, guys, it's time to rest. It's time for us to, to, to go on a ship, find a quiet place for us to take much needed rest. Okay, so we see this is a, something that Jesus Christ himself did, but even himself as an employer of his apostles made sure they had time where they could take leisure, where they could rest and eat. 
So yeah, you, you know, your lunch break, it's biblical, all right? Make sure, you know, you don't work through your lunch break. Make sure you take advantage of that opportunity to rest a little bit. You'll be more effective for the coming hours after your rest to, to be more productive, to be more efficient on your job. And you know, brethren, when it comes to this coronavirus, it's given a lot of us time to rest, you know, a time to stop and and, uh, you know, I, I'm not as busy as I was before this lockdown. And, you know, I can be frustrated, and brethren, yes, I am a little bit frustrated. You know, I, I sort of feel like my main purpose is to be a pastor, to, to run church services. And um, in, in some aspects, I kind of feel like I'm not fulfilling the role that God has given me. But at the same time, I have to think positively, you know, if you think negatively, if you're downcast, if you're frustrated and whining and complaining, you're going to find that a lot of your energy levels are going to be zapped by, by being depressed, by being, by being upset all the time, you know, and it's important during this time, you know, where there's a lot of uncertainty, there's a lot of, you know, we don't have answers, there's this lockdown, we can't meet for church, that we think positively, and brethren, you know, that's what I've started to do. Once I got over the frustration of being locked down, I just thought, well, what's the advantages? You know, how, you know, what advantages do I have now that I'm kind of forced to take a break? I'm kind of forced to, to rest. And, uh, you know, when I thought about just myself personally, I was sharing this with some other people that if there was ever going to be a lockdown, this was the right time for me personally. <laughs> <laughs> you know, maybe not for you, but for me personally, this was the right time to have a lockdown. You know, my wife is heavily pregnant. She's due, she, she can give birth any moment, really. I mean, she's, she's, her due date's in the next two weeks, so she can give birth any time from now to, to the two weeks. Uh, and of course, leading up to that, she was heavily pregnant. And even my wife was saying, look, she was going to find, a bit, uh, find it a bit difficult to get to church for some services, um, that she wouldn't necessarily be able to come to all three services, that she's, you know, my wife's not a very big lady, but the babies she delivers are always normal sized or even slightly larger than normal. And so, you know, she has to carry a lot of weight around that. And, you know, thank God she doesn't have to miss out on any, any services because we haven't been able to meet for church services during this time. So in a sense, it's been a blessing to her, you know, and when she's at this stage in, in, in pregnancy, obviously she needs my help a little bit more around the house, a little bit more to help with the children, these kinds of things. And so just having that time where I'm spending more time with the family has been a blessing, you know. And, you know, if, as many of you know, I've got the church down in Sydney there, Blessed Up Baptist Church, where I would frequently travel almost every week, you know, traveling down there. And there's been a, a rest from that. You know, it, it does take quite a lot out of you having to travel every week, you know, and I know the flight's only an hour and a, what is it, an hour and 20 minutes, but just, just get into the airport, waiting, you know, getting off, getting off the plane, catching the train, getting into my house, preparing, you know, it still requires a lot of work on, on a weekly basis to travel down to Sydney. And while I love doing that, and while I love seeing the brethren down there, you know, I'm, take, I'm looking at it again from a positive perspective and say, well, maybe God's just forcing me to have a bit of a rest. You know, this is a good time to take a break, to take a rest, and just to be with your family. So, you know, I think if there could ever be a lockdown, this was the best time for us to get a, have a lockdown. You know, my wife's going to give birth at some point. We know this lockdown will continue for at least another four weeks, as what the Prime Minister has said recently. So, it's a good time for my wife to give birth. You know, our house, it's going to take a little bit of time to, to settle down with a new baby, find the right routine for our family. So we're thinking in that sense, well, God, you've given us some extra time to sort ourselves out with the delivery of this new baby. And of course, you know, when I speak to other brethren, other brethren that travel to work, to and from work, you know, people are saving many, many hours of, of instead of driving, you know, they're saving a lot of money on, the, on their fuel, you know, to, to be able to work from home. You know, a lot of people have been able to work from home in this situation. And so they, once again, get to spend more time with their family. Instead of spending the hours on the, in a car, they're spending those extra hours with their family members. So, you know, we're, we're, we're being forced to rest during this coronavirus outbreak. Let's take advantage of it. Let's think positively. Let's make sure we use our time wisely on productive things, on godly things, on biblical things. Spend our time wisely to spend, you know, with our families and not our time just waste, you know, wasting our times on television and, and, you know, Netflix and all these kinds of things. No, let's spend our time wisely with the rest that God has given us. Back in Ruth chapter 2 and verse number 8. Ruth chapter 2 and verse number 8. Then said Boaz unto Ruth, Hearest thou not, my daughter? 
Go not to glean in another field. And that's the title for the sermon this morning. Go not to glean in another field. Bo is saying, look, just stay here. You can glean as much as you want on the land. We're not going to stop you. You know, you don't need to go, you know, you don't need to travel somewhere else. You're going to get what you need right here. And then he says, neither go from hence, but abide here fast by my, by my maidens. Let thine eyes be on the field as they do reap, and go thou after them. Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? And when thou art athirst, go unto the vessels, and drink of that which the young men have drawn. So Boaz comes to Ruth and shows her exceptional kindness. Not only does he allow her to hang around on his land and to take as much as she needs, to glean as much as she, she needs, but she, he also offers her to drink of the water that's been drawn by the young men that are working the field. You know, she doesn't have to bring her own water. She, she can just go to, to, to take advantage of what the workers are drinking and to help herself from in that situation. So Boaz has given her more than she deserved as she was on that field. And you know, when I think about this, this, you know, go not to glean in another field. You know, God has given us many things to provide our needs, you know, to provide, you know, yes, you know, this is the context of food, but God has given us his Bible, you know, he's given us his word to be the spiritual food for our lives. You know, and I think about that, you know, go not to glean in another field. You know, God has given you 66 books of the Bible, the canon of Scripture. You're going to find everything you need for your spiritual life in this book. Okay? God does not want you going to the Apocrypha to find some spiritual truth that is not in the Bible. There's no spiritual truth in the Apocrypha. Okay? Those books that the Roman Catholics think should be part of the Bible. No. God has given us the canon of Scripture. Don't glean in another field. Don't go and glean in the Apocrypha. You're not going to find anything of value, of spiritual, maybe historic value, but nothing of spiritual value. There are things in the Apocrypha that are contradictive to the Word of God. In fact, the reason the Roman Catholics love the um, uh, purgatory, you know, the, the belief of purgatory, that it's this halfway place between heaven and hell, and once you suffer enough in purgatory, you go into heaven. The reason the Roman Catholics love the Apocrypha is that's the only book that mentions something like a purgatory. Okay? But there is no purgatory in the Bible. And so when, when the Apocrypha has something that is contradictive to the Word of God, that ought to be thrown out. That ought to be not, not to be regarded. Don't go and glean from the writings that is not inspired by God. God has given us inspiration and the preservation of scriptures in His Word. You know, don't go to the book of Enoch. Don't go to the book of uh, Jasper. You know, the, these other books that people turn to where they think, you know, these are, these are books that have been forgotten by man to be included in the Bible. No, those books have been left out of the Word of God. You know, when God directed men to put the canon of Scripture together, you know, this was the hand of God moving men and those books were soon, uh, seen fit to be thrown out, to be not, not to be included. And brethren... Don't go glean at Kurong book, Bookshop. Okay, now, I don't know, if, I think it's an Australian bookshop, you know. Uh, it's a Christian bookshop. Most of what's there is garbage. Okay? I mean, even when you go to the Bible section, you've got other versions there, and the King James Bible section is tiny. It's hard to find. I've, I've been to Kurong. It's hard to find the, the section where they've got King James Bibles. Okay, but when it comes to all the other Bible versions, oh, they're all there. And all the writings of men that you can think of. You know, people spend more time buying books at a place like Kurong to, and think they're going to find some spiritual truth. It's a waste of time. Turn your attention to the Word of God. You know, if you've not read the Bible cover to cover, it's not time for you to go read some other book. Okay, spend your time in the Word of God and only read books. If you're going to read a book, you know, for spiritual truth, read books of men that are saved, that you know their testimony, you know that they've placed their faith on Christ alone, that they're not including works in salvation. Make sure they are believers, number one. Make sure they are people that actually teach from the King James Bible as well. Don't glean from in another field. You know, the King James Bible, don't glean from the NIV, the ESV, the 
New King James Version or the uh, New Living Translation. These are the other popular translations in English of the Bible. Hey, they are corrupt. They've corrupted the Word of God. Don't glean, don't take your spiritual food from a corrupted source. Take it from the preserved Word of God, the King James Bible in the English language. And brethren, when our church services open up again, don't skip church. You know, be here, you know, purpose it in your heart. I'm going to be at every church service that I possibly can be. I want to come and glean and learn from the Word of God to hear the preacher, to hear a man of God stand behind the pulpit preaching the Word of God, that I might hear, that I might glean from a preacher who preaches once again from the King James Version and from a preacher that is saved, a preacher that is saved, a preacher who has proven themselves to be spiritual, proven themselves to be mature, proven to be a soul winner, proven to be a man of God. You know, come to church and purpose it in your heart to glean from church. And I know you can skip church services. I know you can probably think of other things to do, but don't glean in another field. Don't, you know, instead of, you know, missing out on church service, I'm going to go watch whatever's on Netflix. Or I'm going to find, you know, I'm going to watch the, the grand final of some sporting events instead of being in church. You're gleaning in another field. When God has given you the Bible, yes, but He's also given you church. You know, the place that you can be gathered together to be in fellowship, to get the spiritual nourishment that you need for, and for you to be a blessing to other people as well. That's part of your spiritual growth. If you don't learn how to serve, if you don't know how to bless others, if you don't know how to learn how to encourage others, you're missing out on a significant portion of your spiritual growth. And listen, when you listen to a preacher, when you select a preacher to listen to, of course, you know, you've got this church here, you've got this pastor here. You know, I'm not against you listening to other great preachers online. Again, make sure that they are saved. Make sure they are preaching from the Word of God. Don't listen, don't glean from men that want to tickle your ears. They just want to tell you what you want to hear. You know, there is a part of you, brethren, there is a part of you in your flesh to listen to preaching that makes you comfortable. To listen to preaching that doesn't challenge me, that doesn't help me grow, that makes me comfortable in my sins, that makes me comfortable in the fact that I may have never given the gospel to anybody else. Don't go to those people. You're not going to grow. You're not going to mature. You're not going to be able to value the things that are important when you listen to preachers who are there to just tickle your ears. Don't listen to preachers then instead of proving their positions from the Word of God, they prove their positions from man's wisdom, from their own personal reasoning. No, don't listen to people like that, that are, you know, eloquent in speech, and, wow, look, look how he speaks. Look, look how he is. He's just so smart. Listen, if he's not proven what he teaches from the Word of God, don't go and glean from that preacher. You're better off going to the preacher, like myself, who fumbles words, right who sometimes misspeaks but i'm proving what i'm teaching from the word of god and listen i'm not the only one you know i'm not special there are other great men hey there are great men even in our church that stand up and preach the bible they spend their time studying from the word of god so they can feed people the word of god be careful the preachers that you listen to and listen don't glean from the woman preacher either okay from a female preacher that thinks they've been ordained by God for whatever reason to preach. No, God has not given a woman the position of preaching in a church or to be preaching to men. That's not the case, brethren. As soon as you find a woman preacher out there, Joyce Meyer and... I don't, look, I don't even know, because I, I, that's the only name that I know of, okay? I, obviously, I don't spend time listening to these female preachers, but there's a lot of them out there. Don't glean from that person. Hey, look, we've been instructed by God. There are roles, okay? There are different uh, genders. Can I use that term? Two genders, male and female. And God has instructed certain roles and responsibilities for each gender. Why would you listen to a woman preacher? who can't even figure out from the Word of God that it's not her role and responsibility for her gender 
to be standing behind a pulpit preaching from the Word of God. Be careful who you glean from. Be careful, brethren. There's a lot of false teachers out there. Christ warned us. Paul warns us. There's warnings throughout the entire New Testament, even in the Old Testament, of false prophets and false teachers. You know, don't go and glean. Listen, if you found a good church, you found a good preacher, be satisfied. Be content. You know, learn what you can from that person. Don't go around trying to find every other person, you know, trying to find somebody that just agrees with you so you can feel more comfortable. You know, you may have to compromise for a female preacher, you know, to find what, you know, something that you're comfortable with. Don't do that, brethren. Don't go and glean from another field. And listen, don't glean from another family. And I, I, look, I think what I teach here and I've taught this a number of times, I don't know how, I don't think it's that popular. There is this, I don't know what it is, there is a lack of, and I see this amongst families, and I'm not saying my family is perfect, but there seems to be a lack of desire between husband and wives to just get together, to see the problems, to see the issues, to see the, the, the things that need to be fixed in their family, in their marriage, in their children and just put their heads together and say, honey, what are we going to do about it? Honey, what's the solution? Honey, this is going to happen. This is, you know, that is going to happen. What are we going to do to address this? And instead, it's almost like, and I see this even in churches, it's almost like uh, believers would rather try to find what other families do, the, the solutions other families have for their own families, their own problems, and think they can just take that and put it upon themselves and say, well, it, that family seems to be working. That family seems to have it all together. If I just copy what they're doing, if I just glean from them, then I can make my family life a lot better. No. God has given husbands, God has given you a wife to be your help. And wife has given you your husband to be your head. He's given you guys to, to he's made you one flesh to work out what your family needs to open the Word of God, to listen to preaching on family, you know, to learn what God instructs, to then take that instruction and apply it to your own family home, to apply it to your scenario, to apply it to how many children you have, to apply it to the spiritual level of growth that you're at. Don't go and glean from another family. Don't go and try to copy what other people are doing. You need to figure out husbands and wives. Spend time together, figure out the needs of your family. And when you struggle, you go to the Word of God, you go to the wisdom of God and find out what it is that you need to do. Don't glean from another family. You know, the solutions that are built around another family are not solutions that are going to work in your family necessarily. You've got to find the solutions for yourselves. I'll just read to you from 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 5. For after this manner, in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorn themselves being in subjection unto their own husbands. To be in subjection to their own husbands. Verse number 6, Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. God's saying here, if you make yourself subject under your husband, you're doing well. Verse number 7, Likewise ye husbands, Dwell with them according to knowledge. Dwell with your wife. When you come home from work, spend time with your wife. Dwell with her. You know, it's not, oh man, I finished work, I'm going to go find my mates and spend time with my mates. No, God has given your, you your wife to dwell with her, to live with her, to spend time with her. Giving honor unto the wife, even unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Listen, your wife is the weaker vessel. That means she needs more time. For, you need to give her more time. She's more delicate. You need to protect her. You need to strengthen her. She's the weaker vessel. That means you need to spend time with her. You know, Don't spend your time gleaning on some other family or some group of friends. No, God has given you your family. He's given you husbands, your wives, wives, your husbands. Glean from one another. Grow together. Don't spend your valuable time with other people. 
There's, there's, there's no need. If, you, if you're avoiding family time, there's something wrong in your family. There's, there's issues in your marriage and you need to sort them out. Listen, if you're spending good quality family time, you know, you're spending time in church and fellowship with other brethren and you find yourself with other additional time, go for it. You know, spend you know, your time with other people that you know, that's fine. But make sure you don't neglect your family first. Back in Ruth chapter 2 and verse number 10. Ruth chapter 2 and verse number 10. Once again, Boaz here is being very generous, very friendly, very hospitable toward Ruth. And then it says in verse number 10, Then she fell on her face and bowed herself to the ground and said unto him, Why have I found grace in thine eyes that thou shouldest take knowledge of me, seeing I am a stranger? And Boaz answered and said unto her, It hath fully been showed me all that thou hast done unto, unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother and the land of, the, of thy nativity, and art come unto a people which thou knewest not heretofore. The Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust." So why did Boaz, why was Boaz so friendly, so kind toward Ruth? Because he had heard about how kind she had been toward Naomi, toward her mother-in-law, who had lost her husband. And he had heard how, how Ruth decided to make the God of Israel her God. She came to a, to a strange place, but she came to serve the Lord. She came to make the people of God her people. And I covered that in chapter 1 last week. And so Boaz sees good, godly character in this woman and decides to, to bless her, to reward her. Even though she's a poor widow, you know, she wanted to make, her, or her desires were toward the Lord God of Israel. Now, let me just tell you a little bit, you know, you can see the heart of Boaz here. You know, he sees a stranger. He sees a poor woman, but he also sees her heart and her desire to worship God, her desire to know more about the God of Israel. Even though she's a stranger, you know, he sees her value and he looks after her. He's hospitable toward her. You know, I think back when I, I used to, again, be, be a supervisor and a manager, I used to employ a lot of people. And I found that, you know, yes, it's, it's great to just work, it's great to get your paycheck, but what gave me, you know, great satisfaction, great joy, was taking somebody who was young, inexperienced in the job, maybe not even doing all that well, taking that person, spending quality time with that person, you know, training them up, you know, giving them confidence, encouraging that person on the job, and then find that person progress and grow and become confident and become a star employee, become a star worker. That would always give me great satisfaction, you know, in the workplace. You know, or seeing that person that I trained up go and be promoted in other places in the workplace. You know, continue to grow in, in their learning and knowing that I played a part in that person's development. I played a part in that person being successful on the job. You know, my heart as a pastor, yes, you know, to come and, and to worship in the house of God. But what gives me the greatest satisfaction is seeing the people of, of God grow to see uh, people grow in knowledge in, in Scripture, understand you know, the Word of God becoming more open and transparent for them, but also just to see them grow in the Lord, you know, grow in works, go soul winning. People that may have not gone soul winning before, go in soul winning, preaching the gospel, you know, serving the Lord, you know, being an encouragement, just seeing people grow gives me as a pastor great satisfaction. And, you know, when I see other people in the church, you know, people that are more mature. You know, maybe they're not, you know, the most mature of Christians, but, you know, they're more mature than others and they see a young person come in, they see somebody who's not at the same spiritual level and they take him under their wing. They encourage them, you know, that they help them. Maybe they take him out soul winning as a silent partner just to show them, to, to teach them, to, to help them. And when I see that happening in my church, you know, I know that person that's doing that is also finding great satisfaction in, in, in being somebody that develops others. You know, you see the heart of that person. You see where they're at. You know, they're poor. They're a stranger. They don't know much, but you help them along and they can grow spiritually. There's great satisfaction in this 
uh, in this area. And, and brethren, listen, if, you're, if you got into a point in your life where you think, man, you know, I've grown, I, I, I'm, not, I, you know, I'm not learning so much anymore, I'm a mature Christian, and you find yourself just not being satisfied, well, that's because you're probably not spending your time being an encouragement to others. By, by, by looking at those that are downcast, by looking at those that are, that are weak in the faith and helping them along in the faith. When, if you're doing that, you'll find great satisfaction in your spiritual life. Let's go back to Ruth chapter 2 and look at verse number 13. And she said, Let me find favor in thy sight, my Lord, for that, that, for that thou hast comforted me, and for that thou hast spoken friendly unto thine handmaid, though I be not like unto of thine handmaid, handmaidens. And so she recognizes, she goes, look, you're being kind to me. Not, you know, I'm not like the other handmaidens, of course, because she's not a Jew. You know, she was from Moab. And she says, look, you, you know, she appreciates the kindness that he can show even though she's a stranger, even though she's an outsider. You know, Boaz showed great kindness. And I want you to just backtrack to verse number nine again on the same chapter. Look at verse number nine. And these are the words of Boaz. He says, Let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap, and go after them. Now, notice the next words. Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee? Okay. So Boaz is not only telling Ruth, you know, you're welcome. <clears throat> you, can, you can drink of the waters here, and you can glean as much as you need. But he says, I've also told the young men. I've also told the workers that I have here, to leave you alone, okay? They're not going to, to rebuke you. They're not going to run you off the, on, off the land. I've instructed them to let you go about and glean and take as much as you want from this land, okay? So he instructed the young man not to touch or not to rebuke, not to run Ruth, the poor widow, away. And, uh, you know, when I think about this, I think about strangers or visitors that come to church, you know, we have people that come to church and they might be newly saved. Or people come to church and they're not even saved, potentially. You know, we don't know necessarily where they're at. We don't know what they're struggling with. We don't know their journey, their spiritual journey. We don't know how much they know their Bibles. They might be nothing like us, okay? But the reason they walk in and, and, and join a congregation, they join a church, is so they can glean, there's a reason why visitors come. And look, you know, if, if your mind immediately goes, that must be a false prophet, that's someone that's coming to hurt our church, you, 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 you've, you're, you're missing out on, on, on seeing people come in and valuing them the way Boaz was able to value a stranger and say, look, you can come and glean as much as you can. Listen, are we going to get false prophets coming in? Are we going to get false teachers? It's going to happen. But we can't, you know, just be hard on any visitor that comes just because they don't know their Bibles. Just because, you know, they're not aligned in the same way as we are on doctrine. Listen, when someone comes to church, your thought ought to be, this person is coming to glean. This person is coming to take something, to learn something. Maybe to just know the God of this church. The way that Ruth was coming to Israel to know the God of Israel. That might be their intention. I want to know who God is. And Boaz had to instruct the young men, don't touch her. Leave her alone. Don't run her off. Let her glean. And brethren, if your heart, when you see a stranger that comes into the church, if your heart is, what is this person doing here? Is that person coming to hurt us? Hey, I've got to make sure you know, that, that they don't harm us. Listen, if you act that way, they're going to feel that. Listen, they need to be like Ruth. You need to be like Boaz and be hospitable to welcome that person. Say, hey, come, join, our, join us. The hymn books are here. You need a Bible? Here's a Bible. You know, you're welcome. You know, tell me a, bit, a little bit about yourself. You know, we need to be hospitable toward the strangers, toward the visitors. They're going to come in. They're going to be uncomfortable not knowing all these people. They're going to be uncomfortable. Who are these people? What is this church? And if you make him feel like, you know, and look, remember, Boaz had to instruct the young men. What this tells me is someone that's older, that, someone that's more matured, someone that's more experienced will know that when a, when a visitor comes in, that that person's uncomfortable, that that person's not necessarily on the same page as we are. But the young men, 
because of their zeal, because of the lack of, of maturity, you know, because, and look, nothing wrong with, with zeal. We all had to be young people once. They're more likely to think of that person in a negative sense. They're more likely the, the, the one that's going to drive away visitors, that's going to drive away strangers, you know, if they're not in lockstep exactly with what we believe or what we teach. Listen, we need to allow strangers to come in and glean. And if we know this is a place where the Word of God is being preached, then anybody coming in is going to benefit from hearing a little bit of the Word of God. And that's all Ruth wanted. She just wanted the leftovers. She just wanted to glean what was being left on the land after the harvest is being done. And listen, when strangers come in, they just want to glean a little bit. Let them glean and even offer them a bit of water. Offer them more. Give them more than what they were expecting when they first walked into the church. And uh, if you remember, you know, when, when, when the law of gleaning came in, and I just, I'll read it to you again in Deuteronomy 24. And again, what was the reason for the law in verse number 22? It's God said, And thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in the land of Egypt. Therefore I command thee to do this thing. I command you to allow others to glean on your land, to gather for themselves the poor, the needy. Why? Because you were once a bondman in Egypt. Hey, why should you show kindness to visitors in the church? Why should you show kindness to the unsaved world? Or a newly saved Christian? Because you were once a bondman. You were once someone that was on your way to hell. You were once someone that did not understand or know the gospel. You were once, even after you got saved, you were once someone that did not know what the Bible contained. You did not know what God was like. The doctrines you believe now, you did not believe them before. And so you've got to remember, you were once that way. Someone came to you once, gave you the gospel. Someone was able to be kind towards you and preach the word to help you grow. Will you be kind like that to others that find themselves in a bad place as well? Okay, that's the teaching here in Ruth chapter 2. Look at verse number 14. And Boaz said unto her, At mealtime come thou hither, and eat of the bread, and dip thy morsel in the vinegar. And she sat beside the reapers, and he reached her, sorry, and he reached her parched corn, and she did eat, and was sufficed, and left. So how kind is Boaz being to Ruth? Not only can she work on the land, but he invites her to dinner. And uh, with, with the gleaning, with, with, the, with the harvest uh, that she was able to collect, the wheat, Boaz even allowed her to use the kitchen, all right? even to use the, the utensils to heat up her corn, and then she ate of it and she left. So, you know, she was invited to dinner. Verse number 15. Then she was risen up to glean, sorry, and when she was risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, so he commanded the young men once again, right, saying, let her glean even among the sheaves and reproach her not. And let fall also some of the handfuls of purpose for her and leave them that she may glean them and rebuke her not. So she gleaned in the field until even and beat out that she had gleaned. And it was about an um, ephah of, uh, of barley. An ephah of barley. So she goes after she eats. She continues to continue gleaning, continue collecting. But now Boaz instructs the young men. <clears throat> he says, look, as you go and collect, as you go and harvest, drop handfuls of the corn on purpose. Like, you know, not just the gleanings, but actually drop it on purpose. Remember, if you forgot some, something on the field to leave it there for the poor, well, Boaz is going one step further and says, look, just do it on purpose. Just, just leave stuff uh, for, for Ruth that she can collect and, and you can see that she spends all day. This, the, uh, chapter 2, pretty much all the events of chapter 2 all take place on one day. And so she finishes off the day. She collects uh, about an ephah, ephah of barley. I looked this up. This is probably about 20 kilograms. Okay, a, a whole day's work um, collecting all, all day. She collects about 20 kilograms of barley. And um, the next thing that I thought about here is, you know, she started with the gleaning, didn't she? She started with what was being left behind. But now she is purposefully taking handfuls, okay, that was being left behind on purpose, on purpose. And I thought about the spiritual life, the spiritual growth. And we spoke about how, you know, we need to allow visitors, strangers to come in and, and to grow. And, uh, you know, she started with the gleanings, then she started to receive the handfuls. 
And I thought about Hebrews chapter 5 and verse number 13, which reads, For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. So listen, when you're a babe in Christ, when you're a new Christian, you're unskillful in the word of God. And it's like, you know, what you need to receive is just the milk. You're not going to be able to take in everything. You just need to take in the milk. You need to just glean, as it were. Just, just take in uh, the little at a time. But as you continue to grow and to, to develop in the Lord, then there comes a time in verse number 14, it says, But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So as you grow in the Lord, as you mature, as you become full aged, then you can get into the meat of the Word of God. Then you can understand the Word of God a lot more. And you know, as preachers, we need to remember that our preaching needs to, be, uh, needs to have a balance of meat, but also of milk. Because in, in the church, there are people at different levels in their spiritual growth. And there are children that are growing up in church and you know, they don't know the Bible as well as some adults do. And you know, maybe some children even know more of the Bible than what some adults do. So you've got, always got to uh, you know, distribute the Word of God as milk, but also as meat. And I thought about this as, as Ruth is collecting and to the point where she gets 20 kilograms of barley. So she had a lot of meats, right? She worked hard, you know, she spent the time collecting just a little bit at a time, but she gets to the point where she has 20 kilograms of barley. Look at verse number 18. And she took it up and went into the city and her mother-in-law saw that she had gleaned and she brought forth and gave to her that she had reserved after she was uh, sufficed. And her mother-in-law said unto her, Where hast thou gleaned today? And where wroughtest thou? Blessed be he that did take knowledge of thee. And she showed her mother-in-law with whom she had wrought and said, The man's name with whom I had wrought today is Boaz. So Naomi is surprised. You know, look, wow, you, you brought all of this? You know, where did you go? Who allowed you to glean so much? And Ruth says, well, it's Boaz. Look at verse number 20. And Naomi said unto her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he of the Lord who have not left off his kindness to the, living, to the living and to the dead. And Naomi said unto her, The man is near of kin unto us, one of our next kinsmen. All right, so obviously Naomi knows who Boaz is. And, and she says, look, he's, he's uh, near of kin to us. And I had mentioned how a kinsman is someone who was a blood relative. And so, you know, Boaz was a blood relative to uh, Naomi's husband. But notice it says, it's not just a blood relative, but it says uh, he is one of our next kinsmen, one of our next kinsmen. So think about the term neighbor. When you say, uh, you know, our, you talk about our neighbors, you're talking about everybody that sort of lives in your street or people that live in your community. When we think of neighbors in a church, we think about the surrounding areas or where our church normally meets. So we go and preach the gospel to our neighbors, as it were. But if you were to say, my next door neighbor, what are you now speaking about? You're speaking about people in general, people out there in your community. No, when you talk about your next door neighbor, you're speaking about the neighbor that's literally right next to you, on either side or behind you, whatever, however your house is di uh, divided. And so when, when Naomi says that uh, Boaz is one of our next kinsmen, he's saying like, that's, our, that's a very close kinsman. You know, this is why a lot of people believe that uh, Boaz was like a, a cousin, potentially a, a cousin of of Ruth's deceased husband. Okay, so it's, it's, not a, it's not obviously a brother or sister, not, not, not that close, but the next kinsman would be a cousin. So that's why a lot of people teach and believe, and I believe so also, that Boaz was a cousin to the family of Naomi. Verse number 20. Uh, verse number 21, sorry. And Ruth the Moabite said, He hath said unto me, Thou shalt keep fast by my young men, until they have ended all my harvest. And Naomi said unto Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that thou, that thou go out with his maidens, that they meet thee not in any other field. So she kept fast by the maidens of Boaz to glean unto the end of barley harvest and of wheat harvest and dwelt with her mother-in-law. So Boaz is so kind. He says, look, you can come and you can spend all your time you know, gleaning during this harvest time. So obviously, you know, the time of harvest doesn't go on all year long. You know, when you're harvesting once your crop has grown. So at the end of the harvest, it's the end of the gleaning because at some point, whatever's left over is going to rot and, and, and um, 
you know, it's not going to be edible anymore, whatever. And so, you know, uh, Boaz allows Ruth just to continue for the whole harvest. Why is that important? Like she already had 20 kilograms of barley, but it's important because as, as poor widows, you know, they haven't got work, they haven't got land themselves. And so this was going, this, this, there was food necessary to keep them till the next harvest, you know, to, to keep them provided for during the time when the harvest is not happening. So Boaz was kind enough to let them prepare for coming hard times. And so brethren, that's the teaching there from uh, um, Ruth chapter 2. And if I can just finish up on Acts chapter 20, verse 28, which reads, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost have made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he have purchased with his own blood. To feed the church of God. You know, the right church for you is, yes, a church that you have some, you know, brethren that are obviously saved. Yes, the church that's preaching from the King James Bible but also the right church for you is the church where you are being fed the Word of God. You know, I've heard people say, and I've even said these things, you know, sometimes you attend a church and you think, you know, I'm just not being fed. You know, I just, I go to church, I'm spiritually hungry, I want to hear from the Word of God, but I leave and I just, I've not learnt anything. I've not, I didn't get anything out of that sermon. I wasn't challenged, I didn't get any new information, I didn't grow in knowledge. Well, you know, I mean, there are going to be some sermons that feel that way to you because maybe it is milk. Maybe it's milk directed to people that are younger in the faith. But if you find yourself never learning, never growing in a church, never being fed the Word of God, <coughs> you know, your pastor's never opening up the Bible, then you, you probably need to find another church. You need to find a place where you're going to be fed. And Ruth and Naomi said, hey, we're going to be fed if we stay on Boaz's land. He's going to allow us to to glean during the whole harvest. We're going to have enough food to go through the times when we go without. Okay? And so, you know, the final thought there, brethren, if you have a good church, if you're being fed the Word of God, listen, be a blessing, you know, know, serve in in the local body, stay in church. But if you find yourself in a church where you're just not being fed the Word of God, it's probably unnecessary for you to go and find a church where you can grow and learn from from God. All right, God bless.